Winchester Mystery House is a crown jewel in the Santa Clara Valley. This house, an amazing house, was built by Sarah Lockwood Pardee, who married into the Winchester family. This place has been open for tours since 1923. You're going to see unusual things like this. There's architecture, there's incredible craftsmanship. It's a very unique house. Some people believe that these were Sarah's methods for dealing with unfriendly ghosts, baffling the spirits. We don't really know. Um, after 36 years of remodeling, maybe these are just a few of her building mistakes. It's an incredible story. You know, it's a true American story. Sarah Lockwood Pardee Winchester was the heiress to the Winchester fortune. And she came out to California in about 1884, 85, and she bought herself a little house and started a grand remodeling project. And it never really ended. So is everybody ready to discover the unusual, the bizarre, and the beautiful? The house once stood seven stories high. The 1906 earthquake caused a great deal of structural damage to the top floors of the house. Sarah was terrified. At that time, all of this was removed. She took all of it away. And after that, she built out instead of up. This house grew over the years to encompass about 24,000 square feet of space. We can't be sure there's no blueprints, there's no plans. It's not just big, it's huge. The exterior is American Queen Anne, no question. It was almost as if they had a checklist. Turrets, check. Columns, check. It, finials, check. It's, it's Queen Anne. But the interior is absolutely aesthetic movement. So during the aesthetic movement, they didn't see any reason why useful everyday objects shouldn't be beautiful. They felt that beautiful surroundings were morally uplifting, they improved people's quality of life, and so they decorated things, and not just you know, things you would expect to be decorated, like doorknobs with wonderful designs on them, um, hinges. Everywhere you look, there's something that has a special detail to it. That radiator, aside from being useful, is also kind of pretty. You'll find natural images, leaves, flowers, insects, birds. Sometimes it's playful, sometimes it's, um, you know, reminiscent of another culture. Persian, Moorish, Egyptian, Greek, and especially Japanese. You'll see bamboo, all sorts of Asian painted wallpaper. We recently reinstalled the original mantelpieces. They're japanned, which means they're painted black, and then they have incised decoration painted gold. Decorative tiles with the cherry blossoms, the sunflowers in the vases with the fish images on them. You can see there's also some of the finest stained glass windows in the house right there. The Japanese influence was very asymmetrical, which is another aesthetic motif. Another aspect of Sarah's decorating genius was her love of stained glass. She actually ordered about 25 windows that were all variations on a theme. And this is an example of one of her beautiful stained glass windows. They say it's the most expensive one in the mansion. It's not only beveled crystal, it's got um, what they call zipper cuts all around the edges to detail it. I mean, this is, this is fine craftsmanship. That particular window has 13 blue and gold stones in it. Some of these were installed, some were removed during remodeling projects. Some of them were never used. I've never seen um, a collection to rival Sarah's anywhere, not here, not in Europe. The so-called aesthetic movement was in high gear here. It was just an explosion of creative energy. This fireplace contains so many different decorative media. It's got beautiful decorative tiles. It's got carved wood. It's got beveled crystal. It was art for the sake of art was what this movement embraced. This was the decorative arts, windows, uh, textiles, hardware, um, wallpaper. This is your first example of the Lincrusta Walton wall covering. Sarah loved Lincrusta. This was something elegant for the wealthy, and it was used in places like rooms in the White House. It was used in staterooms on the Titanic. You can see three different patterns in here, and you can see how elegant it can make a room look. She started putting it all over the house, and the walls, you'll find it on the ceilings in combination with wood paneling. You can see that wonderful uh, Lincrusta in some of the panels. It looks kind of like a cosmic explosion up there. The grand ballroom supposedly cost about $9,000 to build. The floor is beautiful in here. Um, the edges have rosewood, oak, ash, maple. An interesting thing in this room you might want to take a look at, behind this beautiful carved door is a very utilitarian metal door. Behind that is a safe. 
Another door. Finally, the interior of the safe. She was protecting something in here. And according to legend, when she died, all they found was the obituaries of her husband and daughter and a lock of her baby daughter's hair. Sarah and William only had one child named Annie, who sadly died when she was only about six weeks old. 15 years later, William himself died of tuberculosis. Sarah pretty much grieved for the rest of her life. It was very difficult for her. We're going to head to the seance room. This is, according to legend, where Sarah would communicate with the spirits. Spiritualism was a huge movement during her entire lifetime. It started in Europe, came to the United States, and was fed by the Civil War. Women were losing their sons, their brothers, their husbands. And they were looking for some kind of solace. She wasn't unusual if she practiced it. This exit was built to look like a cabinet. It is actually an exit that leads into the closet of the next room. The house itself has 2,000 doors, 10,000 windows. It has 47 fireplaces, 40 staircases. Through the doorway here, you can see another one of Sarah's architectural oddities. Staircase begins here, goes up, turns, and ends right there. Although Sarah's house is unusual and it teems with unexpected corners and stairways that go nowhere and things like that, it really was in many ways very well thought out. Sarah was a very petite woman. She stood four foot ten. She also suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, which in her later years made it impossible for her to lift her feet more than a couple of inches off the floor. So she devised these small steps, and we call them easy risers. She worked things so that, that the world adapted to her. She had, for example, three elevators in her home. She was constantly trying out new ideas. During Sarah's life, most people used bathtubs. She ordered a special shower to be made. It was being advertised as a needle shower. And the water came out from little holes in those U-shaped pipes. And generally in those days, women weren't encouraged to shower. Picture the tiny Sarah with her rheumatoid arthritis trying to get into a bathtub. It would have been horrible. So this would have been a godsend for someone like her. Plumbing was extravagant for the time, and one of the things she did uh, was to put faucets everywhere. She loved gardening, and she had these two indoor conservatories, where as she got older, she could garden here in the house and not have to go outside. This room in particular is interesting because of the floor. She had wonderful systems for watering her plants, where she could lift up her floorboards and put the plants down on an underfloor made of metal, water the plants on the floor, and it would then, the water would be carried away by special drain pipes. You'll notice there is a hose reel and a faucet. Garden hoses were a brand new innovation. She not only seemed to want to make her life better, but her servants as well. In order to keep her maids from having to be constantly sweeping dust out of the corners, she put these little um, corner pieces in so that the dirt never gets in there. You have built-in laundry trays. They have built-in scrub boards, built-in soap holders, and hot and cold running water. And this was state-of-the-art at that time. Every fireplace, at least except for the gas, um, has a very clever door in the bottom. But all the ash goes down a tube, ends up in the basement somewhere, and there's a little door down there that you can then clean out. I guess today you'd call her an early adapter. There are systems that she could communicate with her team throughout the house. She could press a button like this anywhere in the house and a bell would ring and a number would drop into the window and that would tell the servants where they could find Sarah in the house. She also had a system of call tubes that went through the walls and you could actually hear people, say on the fourth floor, talking to you down on the ground floor. So you would be aware if someone wanted to talk to you, the bell would ring, you'd come to the tube. And it's perfectly audible. They would send them down to the basement, these tubes, and they would shoot across under, you know, under the house and then come up in the part of the house where she wanted them. Sarah Winchester was a true pioneer. She was a woman ahead of her time. I think she just enjoyed the process so much. She just wanted to keep on working. So she would get different ideas and they would try them out. And if it worked, great. If not, they would tear it down and try something new. You know, in Sarah Winchester's lifetime, this house was in a constant state of becoming. You know, for 38 years, uh, construction never stopped. Sarah Winchester would be so proud to know that for 93 years, millions of guests have come into her home and admired it and been inspired by it. And for the next 93 years, that's going to continue.